Iso Takahata's 2013 feature film The Tale of Princess Kaguya has seen no shortage of praise for its visual beauty. Whether it's described as a celebration of hand-drawn animation, a smorgasbord of colorful imagery, or a soothing exercise in simplicity, there lies an undeniable consensus that this film presents an incredible feast for the eyes. What hasn't so much been touched upon though is the arguably main reason behind this wide acknowledgement of the film's visual aspect, namely the unique approach to the animated medium that it displays. There is no doubt that Princess Kaguya doesn't look like a typical anime, or your typical animated work in general for that matter, but what elements does this deviation actually consist of, and what can they say about the work as a whole? At its core, the visual style of Princess Kaguya presents an ambivalence between figuration and abstraction. To get an understanding of what I mean by this, let's look at the relatively recent history of Western painting. Throughout the entire Renaissance period, painting, along with all other art forms, had its main purpose in representing the motif that it portrayed. The depicted scene in question was the first and foremost object of interest, and all forms of artistic expression was to benefit this depicted scene, and by no means get in the way of it. But due to several societal and technological factors, this all took a shift during the 1800s with the gradual rise of modernism. What started as a subtle touch within the Romanticist and Realist movements, and then grew into a noticeably prominent element in Impressionism, was an increasing degree of incorporated abstraction, Paintings weren't just visually figurative windows into another world anymore, but started to more and more become platforms for the artist's own expressions. One essential element that this incorporation of abstraction introduced was the visibility of the medium itself. Simply put, the more abstract a painting is, the more apparent it becomes that it is in fact a painting, while the more figurative it is, the more this fact becomes disguised. This can furthermore be seen as having two main factors. One has to do with the illusion of three-dimensionality. During the Renaissance, painters used various techniques to make their work seem like windows into three-dimensional spaces. But as the abstraction later increased, the painting's actual qualities as flat surfaces became more apparent. The other is the visibility of the brushstrokes, something that before the 1800s was deliberately avoided in order to achieve a more effective sense of realism, but got throughout the modern era an increasing role alongside and sometimes even above the motif. While the interplay between figuration and abstraction saw varying levels throughout many of modernism's movements, its early dawn is a particularly interesting case in that it displays a condition where the halves are on more or less equal footing. These paintings are just as figurative as they are abstract, creating a very tense and interesting limbo between the two, and also consequently between the visibility and the non-visibility of the medium. It is in this limbo that we also find Princess Kaguya. We here see objects and characters that on one hand are visually defined and concrete things with the realistic contours and movements, but on the other hand the film makes no effort in trying to hide the fact that these things are, at the end of the day, pens and brushes on paper. Like the paintings that form the dawn of the modernist era, Princess Kaguya subtly yet actively breaks the illusion of realism that is traditionally upheld in order to immerse the audience, creating a highly unique approach to the animated medium. Several of the film's visual elements are participants in this activity. One of them is the charcoal used to draw all the outlines, making them significantly more distinct than the discreetly thin lines of typically used graphite pencils. Much of this distinctness is due to the less monochrome character of the charcoal material, bearing a slight fussiness to it as well as being more dynamically sensitive in its usage. This becomes especially evident in the animation, wherein each individual frame set of charcoal lines are visually different from the next making the frames themselves all the more noticeable, which in turn creates a disruption in the film's sense of motion. Accompanying these charcoal lines are the watercolors provided by the film's art director Katsuo Oga. Having previously worked on various Ghibli and Madhouse films since the 1970s, Oga's images contain a generally light yet vibrant flavor, which in Princess Kaguya is giving a leading role. Instead of being merely present in the background, as is typically the case, the watercolors are here used for all visual elements on screen thus taking a central role in the film's action. This ultimately results in an overall more abstract visual touch. Due to watercolor's physical nature, it is both hard to control and has a rather moist look to it, something that can work very naturally for backgrounds and surroundings, but results in notably less concreteness when applied to the things in the foreground, not least when they are in motion. Added to this is also a general sense of minimalism. 
Instead of trying to achieve a realistic immersion through detailed drawings and fluid animation, Princess Kaguya presents a much more restrained approach in its visual direction, one that purposefully involves absence. The charcoal lines aren't drawn to necessarily complete the shapes of their objects, but only enough to make them visible. Just as the watercolors don't always fill in these shapes entirely, or are even retained within their borders. Several sceneries even contain big areas of blank paper, where no background art has been added. So not only are these two materials inherently filled with distinct expressions, but the highly simplistic and loose manner in which they're used even further highlights these expressions. Together, these three elements, the charcoal, the watercolor, and the minimalism, is what forms Princess Kaguya's degree of abstraction. We see how the illusion of three-dimensionality is subtly broken, partly because of the same materials being used for both background and foreground, and partly because of the large areas of blank paper. We also see a strong visibility of the brushstrokes in both the charcoal and the watercolor usage, as well as in the simplistic looseness by which they are applied. Even though this visual style is highly unique in the context of general animation, it isn't the first time that Takahata himself has used it. The exact same combination of charcoal lines, watercolors and restrained minimalism can be seen in his prior film My Neighbors the Amadas from 1999. Here it is used to create a more sketchy and comic strip-like aesthetic, which purposefully adds to not only Finn's light-hearted and comedic tone, but also its format, consisting of a series of vignettes about the daily lives of its titular ensemble cast. As such, the visual direction of the film is very plain, simple and monotonous. Its successor, however, being a more dramatically charged story, presents a much more dynamic approach. The watercolor uses widely shifting color palettes to set the tone for various scenes, from cheerfully bright greens and pinks to somberly dim grays and blues. Similarly, the charcoal is utilized in varying ways to convey both different physical actions and the underlying emotions of these actions. In this scene, for example, we see how our protagonist is joyfully swirling under a blossoming cherry tree. The charcoal lines portraying the contours of her face and clothes, as well as her hair, are expressively drawn to capture the movements of the scene, but are at the same time thin enough to leave most room for the bright and vibrant watercolors. Compare that to this scene. Here, the charcoal is given absolute central focus, forcefully capturing both the physical movement and the feelings of our character with its rough and scribbled drawings. Kaguya being portrayed from a distance is reduced to almost no more than a blob, as both she and her surroundings are devoured by an incredibly strong level of abstraction. If this visual style was established by the Yamadas, then Princess Kaguya presents a significantly more elaborate utilization of its possibilities. According to Takehata himself, this depiction of physical and emotional expressions through the usage of abstraction appears to be completely intentional. Rather than drawing in every detail and depicting something as if the real thing were there, paintings inherently have the great power to stir up the viewer's vivid imagination and memory when the brush is used sparingly to give an impression of the real thing. I chose this style because I didn't want people to forget this. The lines drawn here are not just contours of the real things, but rather ways to instantaneously capture the expression of those things. And if there is movement, then they are the pictures that vividly capture the force of the movement. Continuing on the same quote, he also states another interesting thing. This technique of giving expression to the line and leaving blank spaces so that the entire surface of the painting is not filled, which engages the viewer's imagination, is one that holds an important place not only in traditional paintings of China and Japan, but also in sketches in Western drawings. What I have done is to attempt to bring this technique to animation. As suggested in this last paragraph, the core concept at hand here is mainly influenced by traditional Chinese and Japanese painting. Expanding upon this, I'd like to look at one of the traditions that Takahata is supposedly referring to, namely Japanese ink painting, and see what meaning can be drawn from comparing it to the film. The ink painting of Japan is a tradition that spans as far back as the mid-14th century, when Zen Buddhist monks introduced the Chinese school of Chan to the country in the form of Sibokuga. While Chan painting was traditionally done by monks for meditational purposes, its Japanese counterpart generally consisted of copying Chinese imported models, all while staying as true as possible to their original aesthetic. Soibokuga subsequently reached its height during the Muromachi period, when it spread into the general art world and rose in popularity. Later, during the 18th century, the tradition saw a new wave when Japanese intellectuals caught a keen interest for the outside world, and paintings of the new, more individualistic iteration of the Chan school were entering Japan through the port of Nagasaki. 
The result was a new and updated version of the Soibakuga tradition called Nanga. Even though this new wave was based on a school of individualism and free expression, like its predecessor, it still saw an importance in remaining true to its peers. This all changed, however, with the rise of artist E.K. Taiga, who took this newly formed school and friskily played around with its frameworks, incorporated one unorthodox method after the other. With several pupils and followers succeeding him, Taiga established Nanga as a school of experimentation and expressive playfulness. If one were to compare Princess Kaguya to a specific incarnation in the history of Japanese ink painting, it would be Nanga. More than that, it wouldn't be too far-fetched to draw a parallel between the evolution from Suibokuga to Nanga and the development from My Neighbors the Amadas to Princess Kaguya. So what does the visual resemblance of Nanga and its associated ink painting tradition say about this film? Well, first off, it can be seen as bearing a thematic relevance, considering the film is an adaptation of one of Japan's oldest folk tales. Second off, and perhaps most interestingly, it bears a contextual significance. I'm talking about a subversion against the historical origin of its own medium, that is, anime. Let's go back to the 18th century for a minute. During the same period as the rise of the upper-class oriented Nanga, another art form emerged within the middle class called Ukiyo-e. Roughly translating to pictures of the floating world, Ukiya was done through either painting or reproduced woodblock prints, and depicted various motifs from the urban nightlife of the Edo era bourgeois. In contrast to Nanga's use of ink, the visual depictions of Ukiya followed the traditions of Yamato e, a form of painting that dates back as far as the hand scrolls of the 12th and 13th centuries. Despite containing the same sense of minimalism as its ink-based counterpart, Yamato Air bears a fundamentally different sense of visuality, with its high attention to detail, thin but well-defined lines and contours, and strong monochrome colors. As such, the visual style of Ukiya differs significantly from that of Nanga, especially in relation to figuration and abstraction. Whereas the latter portrays its motifs through visible brushstrokes and an impressionistic looseness, the former hides its brushstrokes while using clear-cut outlines and colorations. One of the most famous ukiyo-e artists, whose song works are widely recognized even today, is Katsushika Hokusai. Hokusai rose to fame because of one particular series of sketches, published between 1814 and 1878, that featured various light-hearted and often comedic depictions of everything from animals and landscapes to everyday activities and supernatural creatures. While originally intended as an art instruction book to aid his bad income, the first volume quickly became a public success for its realistically detailed images, making him follow it up with 40 more books throughout the years. Because of the collection's fairly silly tone, he decided to title it with the terms Mam, meaning whimsical, and Ga, meaning pictures. In other words, manga. While this was at the time no more than a coinage for a collection of pictures that have little to no resemblance of what we today know as manga, it is still highly likely that Hokusai, along with the Okiyo-e art form in general, laid a significant foundation for the medium. Not only was Okiyo-e a low and kitsch-esque form of artistic expression, active within the urban middle class of Japan's last pre-modern era, whose subsequent main distribution through woodblock prints made it more or less equivalent to comics, but also its embodied visual style of yamato e carries notable similarities to that of manga with its, once again, clearly defined lines and contours and general lack of abstraction. Even practical resemblances of manga can be traced through the history of yamato e particularly in the form of the aforementioned narrative hand scrolls, or emakimono, which consisted of a series of pictures and accompanied texts that together told the right-to-left chronological story. Taking this particular context into consideration, the visuality of Princess Kaguya is given a very interesting connotation. It is from this perspective a callback to an artistic tradition that was in parallel with one of anime and manga's founding art forms. What's furthermore interesting about this is that while Okiyo-e has in a sense lived on through anime and manga, the Nanga tradition did not survive after the 19th century. This callback does carry several layers. On a surface level, it can be seen as a form of Nanga revivalism, an attempt at shaking new life into this extinct art form by applying it to modern animation. On a deeper level, this revivalism can also be seen as an act of rebellion against the film's own medium, by embracing an art form that was active alongside anime's origin, and ultimately got left behind. As such, the film's deviation against anime's visual conventions doesn't just involve its incorporated abstraction, but also the historical relationship between its own visual style and the medium's origin. At the end of the day, we can conclude that the tale of Princess Kaguya's visuality is more than just visual beauty. It is one that technically and contextually not only defies, but also challenges its own medium and the norms of its visual representation.